Our next speaker is Mr. Ron Alciati. He is the Supply Chain Manager of Micro's Consumer and Electronics Global Business Unit in China, where he has been for the past 13 years, and from where he has come just the last 100, I believe. Um, Ron brings a host of experience relevant to this conference. He has moved and supported his career in engineering and business development and for the past five years in his current area of supply chain.
ESOP companies left in the United States of America. It's also one of the largest. We have 44 locations in 15 countries. So for a basically a ESOP company, which is employee you know, owned, that, that is a huge accomplishment. 44 locations in 15 countries. Nibel's philosophy really is about change. We have three global business units, which are consumer electronics, healthcare, and packaging. And it's very interesting because the next bullet point that I bring up is was really added last. Right? And it's just like coincidence more than anything else, but it contains one key word. And I took this uh, this next phrase, a paragraph, from the NICRO website, which, you know, being a 13-year employee of NICRO, you would think I'd go to our website more often, but I really don't, right? But I just happened to put this together. I said, oh, I'll go to the website and get some information. And here's what came up. Let me read it over here for you. Our business has been growing steadily for more than 55 years, navigating through dramatic change, all right? So it happens to be that the on our website, the front page, it says dramatic change. That goes to show you how vital change is to any operation, any organization, right? In plastic space, numerous recessions, and a constant migration of markets all over the world. That's who Michael is. NIPO in China. I made this relatively simple. Basically, NIPO in China started in 1993 with one facility located actually in the Shenzhen, where I've been home based for the last 13 years. At the time, the marketplace really, the environment was had been abundant labor pool, right? which was quite logical. Considering you have 1.3, 1.35 billion people, there were a lot of people, but they were inexperienced, but eager to learn, work, and eager to learn. All right, they had a big drive, and I think what was just mentioned is some people tell me Chinese are more capitalistic than in nature than Americans, or at least equal to us. It's true. Believe me, there's a lot of people willing to do almost anything to make a living. At the time, 1993, wages were cheap. And I'll tell you how cheap in a few minutes. There was limited competition, right? at least for Nitro in the segment that we uh, support. Right? Very limited competition. There were a couple companies of equal size, global footprint in China at the time, but not so many. The margins. Nobody here talked about margins too much today, but believe me, in order to run a business today, or any day, you need to make enough margin, profit, to survive, right? So at the time, 1993, the markets were actually excellent because there was limited competition. And all the environment was very favorable, such as cheap labor, so on and so forth. And friendly regulations. Basically, there's a lot of misconception about China. People in this room understand China, China and the environment there fairly well. But as a lay person, my family, maybe some of your families, some people that have never had any involvement with China, they have this tendency to believe that you can go to China and treat labor any way you want to. Believe me, it's not true. Some of the restrictions and regulations in China are far more stringent than they are here. Not only stringent, but to give you an example, if you're a, uh, a young lady or a lady and you're pregnant, here in the States, you might get a few weeks of paid maternity leave. My wife, who just had a baby not too long ago, right? She had five months paid maternity leave, right? By law, right? She got three months just as normal maternity leave. She got one month because she had a baby over 30 years old, and she got another month because she had a C-section versus, you know, mother delivery, right? Five month paid requirement, all right? So, what I'm getting at here is that the regulations are friendly. And at 1993, they were even friendlier. It was easy to do business there. And in conclusion, it was the right place to be at the right time. As simple as that. If, if you got into China in 1993 or earlier, you might have struggled in some ways, but it really was the right place to be at the right time. 
since then, 2010. Right. What's happened? Nigro now has, instead of just one facility, we have multiple facilities. We have a facility in Tianjin, which is a couple hours away from Beijing. One in Suzhou, a couple hours away from Shanghai, and still the Shenzhen operation. So it's grown. Believe it or not, and people laugh at me, there again, people in this room might not, but in China today, there are labor shortages. Right? Uh, we talked about it at uh, lunch. Basically, in Guangdong province alone, they're quoting labor shortages of at least a million people. Right? You wonder, how could that be? Especially given the fact that we're coming out of a recessionary period. One of the worst recessions history of the world. Well, it's not pretty obvious. Either. What happened is basically when the recession first or the economic crisis really first started, you know, a year and a half, two years ago, whatever it was, China made some policy changes. Right? Along with there again, some people think that the recession never really, you know, affected manufacturing. Nobody lost their job. Well, believe me, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of people in China, especially direct labor, did lose their jobs. Right? It wasn't talked about. Because China is more of a, you know, don't talk so much about the bad thing because the more you talk about it, the worse it gets. Maybe we can learn from that. But, so the more you talk about it, the worse it gets. So they really don't talk about the bad things so much. Because their philosophy is, is let things be and they'll get better on their own. No need to panic everybody. So they really did not go around the world saying, oh, we've lost millions and millions and millions and millions of jobs. They didn't say that. They led most people to believe that things were okay. But facts are, a lot of jobs were lost. So when I say that, you say, well, how could there be labor shortages with so many people lost their jobs? Basically what happened is China created a, uh, well, I'm going for that. Generally speaking, in factories in China, it's probably 70, 80, 85 percent females. All right? And in 1993, a lot of these females entered the workforce. They were young girls. They were in their late teens, early 20s. And they spent the next 15, 16 years, whatever it was, give or take, right? working in factories, away from home, especially in cities like Shenzhen, which I just heard with like the Wild Wild West was true. I mean, everybody migrated to cities like Shenzhen for opportunity. And so now the economic crisis comes. A lot of these young ladies, or middle-aged ladies by now, they get sent home. Well, part of the culture in China is have a baby, right? And basically, now that these ladies had no excuse for staying away from marriage, from staying away from their families, they had to go back home because they didn't have anything else, they got married. They had children. So they took a big part of the workforce that was available, took it out of the system. Now they stayed at home in the villages or wherever they were from. Right? Along with that, China created some uh, stimulus packages that made it easier to start your own business for locals. So a lot of the labor pool basically now had opportunity to do their own business, wherever that might be. Remember, some of these people have been away from their homes for 5, 10, 15 years. This was a perfect chance for them to go back, be with the people that they've been missing, because they've been isolated in so many cities, working in the factory, going to the dormitories. So what happened is now that the economy started to get better, that labor pool was not available any longer. It actually, and the economy in China, because it's leading the economic turnaround, right? It's, it's growing faster, or coming out of the recession faster than Earth in the world. The labor pool is not available. So it has created tremendous shortages. Like I said, in 1993, it was inexperienced and eager to learn. Now, the labor pool is basically after 15, 18 years, they're knowledgeable, all right? They know what they're doing. Substantially higher wages. Somebody talked about this earlier, but give me an example of how much higher. 
1993, and I went out and I questioned some of the people that used to work for me. And one of the young ladies that uh, Amy knows, uh, Ms. Wong, she started her career in 1993. And at the time, she was making, as an engineer with a degree, she was making 199 RMB a month. All right, um, $250, $300, whatever it might be. No, not even, $25, $30, sorry, right? Very little. So, that same young lady today, she's unfortunately left Nigro because we couldn't afford to keep her, is making 3,600 US dollars per month, all right? Now, like was mentioned earlier, in a lot of cases, good labor, skilled labor, educated labor is very, very, very expensive. And you might say to me, Rob, doesn't everybody in your sector, manufacturer, basically have the same problem? So basically it's a wash. You would think so, but not necessarily. In a case like this, is we're not losing those people to the same industry. We're losing it to the non-manufacturing sector, which puts a higher burden on the manufacturing sector. Some of the, like the luxury sector, could afford to pay more because the operating margins are a lot higher, all right? But in Nyko's industry, the operating margins are much lower. We can't afford to pay the same thing, but we have to compete against it in order to get the right kind of help. So, a lot of changes in the last number of years. Tremendous competition. This is where I'm gonna get into a little bit on the, Massachusetts has a handful of companies with uh, 500 employees or more, right? in the city of Shenzhen alone. And some of you that do business in Shenzhen will know this company even though I won't uh, name them by name. Our competition, at their prime, I think around 19, or 2008, 2007, in the city of Shenzhen, this one company deployed, I hear numbers, I'll give you the high number just for a hot house, 500,000 people, all right? Probably you know who it is, it's a Taiwanese company. Now, I've heard anywhere from 300,000, 400,000, 500,000. It really doesn't matter. That's the competition. One company with, I don't want to say one facility, one campus, right? It's like a city. 500,000 people working for one company. That's the competition, right? So, a handful of companies of uh, 500 workers or more in Massachusetts is, seems insignificant compared to that. And at the same time, there are tens of thousands of these small to medium sized companies that are all competitive, right? All are competitors. Like you said, somebody said, the hardware is available. All you have to do is have money. So, everybody in the country seems to be putting in molding machines, which is our core competency. And yes, today or five years ago or three years ago or tomorrow, they're not as good as micro, but they all represent competition. Amount of competition. Now, I'll give you an idea of how much competition. About in 2005, I was asked to, to uh, create a specialized supply chain for uh, tool makers. And prior to that, I was a small town guy in Connecticut, and basically, you know, you have a, in Connecticut, I mean, maybe at the prime, you had 100 good tool makers. In Guangdong province in 2005, there were 20,000 individual companies doing tool making. That represents a tremendous amount of competition. So competition is vast. Stress profits, all right? Labor rates are going up, all right? And not only that is, I call this a really an abnormal environment. Throughout history, especially here in the States, there was always cost reduction requirements. We all get the requirement from whoever our companies are, our uh, clients are, basically, you know, give me 3% per year cost reduction, give me 5% per year cost reduction. And basically, as an organization, manufacturing organization, you're able to make up that cost reduction requirement by operational efficiencies, or some, something you did internally to keep your margins high. Well, in the last five, six years, because of or because of this competition, basically, it's driven the prices down of everything. Now, we have some major, major customers, global accounts, where the 
cost reduction requirements are minimum 6% per quarter, 24% per year, all right? Up to 20% per quarter, all right? You can no longer make that up in operational efficiencies. I have to move along here. Stricter regulation. But basically, it's the right place to be during changing times. And I have two quotes for you. One is from uh, Bruce Burton. He was a congressman and uh, a businessman. And he said, when you're through changing, you're through. And one was by Pearl Bailey. She was an entertainer. And she said, you must change in order to survive. And this really gets that really into my next portion. What has NICO done to change? Basically, in 1993 in China, we were molding only. And throughout NICO's history, up until that point, we just did molding. Call it shoot and ship. 1996, we did EMI shielding and assembly. 98, we did precision tooling. 99, painting and IMD molding. 2002, product design. We added our own product design company. The supply chain and then doing metals. What I'm really going to get at as a conclusion is that the environment in China has changed significantly from 1993 to current. The story of today is different from that of yesterday, which is obvious. Costs are higher, expectations are greater. Opportunity is precious, right? We have to take every opportunity you get because it's very precious. If you don't, somebody else will. Competition is fierce, abundant, and hungry. Maintaining a company's competitive edge requires constant change. Survival depends on change. Companies that prepare well for change will survive. Those that do not could become, and I'm going to use the strongest words that probably were said in anybody's speech today. If you don't change, you may become extinct. Thank you.